of all, thank you for, for your for a wonderful presentation. You know, I think one of the things you said that really, really resonated is make a product intuitive. You know, there's so many products out there, they're great ideas, but then the, the user doesn't, you know, and you really have to keep that end user in mind, their involvement is critical. And you said that a number of times during your presentation. So thank you for, for really um, focusing our attention on those, those issues. Um, and now we're gonna go to our, our panel. It's, and one of the things that's really kind of the Germans say of Wolter Faden or read the thread that goes through all of these talks was how are we, are we getting the people at the table that are, you know, are going to really help us become more innovative and, and to really address the issue at hand. I mean, even starting with Oscar and Karen at the beginning, um, and then, you know, with different areas of New York City, um, you know, and also we had May Lin talking about, um, you know, the, the people-centered internet. And also we have um, Brock talking about children and seeing them as experts and, and also making their voices heard and not intimidating them when they do have answers that the people that are, are asking the questions don't, or think, don't think that are, are relevant. And then again, you, Gopal, as well, as I just mentioned, um, these are, are all, you're all talking about getting the, the end user um, involved in these critical decisions. So I guess I'd like to start you know, my first question, first of all, the, the audience members, please feel free to ask questions and um, put them in the chat and we will um, try to address them. Um, but my first question actually will go to Maylin since you were the first speaker. Um, and you talked about the people-centered internet. What has been one of your biggest roadblocks and how have you addressed it? Thanks, Joanne. I think the biggest roadblock is that we are driving into the future looking in the rear view mirror. And so if you're just talking about what worked in the past and what's happened back there and you're not looking ahead, um, it's very hard to have a conversation about how to steer in the right direction if people are only looking in the rear view mirror. This came up in several of the conversations here where um, Steering ahead needs checking with the community, talking to the end users, finding out whether things are going to work, doing sandboxes. The design world is steering in the right direction. I, I cannot emphasize how important it is for the Global Design Thinking Alliance to understand that your societies need you. You are the headlights that they need to understand how to steer into the future. And so I actually think we have a communication problem within the design thinking world thinking, oh, it's just us, we're in the back room, don't pay attention. No, they need design thinking. Design thinking is absolutely needed for things to be people-centered. So I was very, very pleased to be part of this panel. Thank you. Back to you, Joanne. And, and thank you, Maylin. And, and you just talked about that taking people seriously, you know, those people in the back room. And, and Brock, you brought up this, the bringing the children in. Can you talk about, I mean, you talked about it a little bit, but go more into detail about the strategy about getting these experts to really take the, the children seriously, because it's about well-being and the children are the experts of their own well-being. So can you maybe, bring, um, maybe expand on what you talked about a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, and <laughs> and really, it, it ha I find it happens in in every aspect of our work. So, like whether it's this work with kids, work in healthcare, work in education, the people in charge and the people making decisions, as much as they, with all of the best intentions, think they know best, uh, they have a really hard time relinquishing uh, control and relinquishing any kind of power decision-making. And I think so much of it is wrapped up in, if I'm in that kind of job and role, I'm there because I have some kind of expertise or experience that put me there and I'm paid a salary to be there. And it really rubs up against my own knowledge and what I think the answers I'm supposed to have because I'm in this job. I think that's one of the challenges in design thinking. I think this idea that we don't actually have to have all the answers. We have to understand how to steward these processes. We have to understand how to create space for the end users for the people that have the answers and the knowledge and expertise in their own lives. And how do we get out of the way of that? And when that rubs up against our 
sense of self and our sense of identity because so much is wrapped up in what I know and my expertise. And then some kid says, your idea is dumb, it'll never work. That's really hard to hear because <laughs> I'm the CEO of some organization nationally that serves kids all across the country and I'm supposed to have the answer. So it's really hard because it, it bumps up against our ego. So I think a lot of what we try to do in any of these settings is before we bring kids into the room, we talk to the adults in the room about, here's how you're going to participate. Here's what's likely to happen. Here's how you say yes. Here's how you be an ally. Here's how you, here's how you participate today. And we try to set the conditions to, to get them ready <laughs> for whatever they're going to hear, because it's going to be something they've never heard before, probably, or never treated seriously. And then it's all of the you know, workshop techniques and facilitation techniques and all the things that you do to try to create a space where people can create together. But I think, it's, I think so much of it is, is people's ego getting in the way. And so it's setting conditions ahead of time so that people can participate fully. And, and yeah, and I, and I think also showing our own vulnerability sometimes makes the others more confident in really getting them to, to speak out um, about their, their own issues. Um, yeah, and, and Gopal, what about you? I mean, what, what are, similar to what I asked Brock, in the healthcare field, what are some of the areas, what some, some of the strategies you've used that, you have, that you've you know, mentioned or not, haven't mentioned? Thanks, Joanne. Yeah, I completely agree with what Brock said, uh, first of all. So having the humility to set aside, you know, whatever we might think we know. So setting aside uh, the preconceived notions, setting aside our ego, and having the humility to listen to people and hear their problems, even if they're uncomfortable to hear about, um, before we leap to conclusions about what the solutions are. I think that's a that's a really important starting point. I think... Um, for me personally, and for people I've worked with, the most important part has been visiting, uh, for instance, uh, just continuing with the vaccine example that I shared, um, visiting health clinics in uh, across sub-Saharan Africa, in India, in other country, other parts of the world, um, talking to people and seeing what they're dealing with. Because honestly, if... Uh, understanding the lives of healthcare workers was so incredibly humbling. Um, I think sitting uh, here in North America or in Geneva or somewhere else, it's so easy to say, you know, it's because healthcare workers don't have enough training that uh, they're not taking care of their fridges properly or the vaccines are getting frozen. It's, it's, you know, they need more training. They need better incentives and so on. Whereas once we got to the field and once we went to the health clinics, it was easy to see that there was no issue with training or motivation or, um, or anything else. These healthcare workers were going so above and beyond. In many cases, they wouldn't even receive money to buy vaccines. They would, they would pay out of pocket to buy vaccines to immunize children in their community. And so uh, there was no way we could not be humbled by that that level of commitment to their job. And uh, I think that really helped us set aside our egos and uh, you know, achieve a level of humility to say, okay, these people really, I mean, we have no, we have no right to judge these people. Um, we have to learn from them instead and, and be inspired by them. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Gopal. And, and I think to add to that, you know, when you're interviewing people, we often see ourselves as experts, but, and, and when we think of them, it's not just about think, getting, changing that mindset, but it's also about the actual process of interviewing them is let them do most of the speaking and not, you know, having us. And, and I think that's one of the mistakes a lot of times we make is, is we, you know, we speak more than the people that we're interviewing. Um, and okay, so we're a little beyond our time right now, but if anybody, I, I don't see any questions from the audience, um, at least on my chat, if, if uh, somebody else in the tech group has please uh, bring that up. Otherwise, do, do you, as the, the, the three panelists, do you have any questions for each other? Because you haven't had that opportunity to ask. Feel free to ask before we, um, before we leave to the break, because we're a little over time. But if you have any questions or you have final comments, please let us know. I do. I think, I think all of us should stick together and do something. And one suggestion is in the New York City, given that the UNHQ is there, actually coming up with the idea of a clearinghouse uh, that could take 
the lessons that we've actually discussed and supported by Hassel Platner Institute has an open MOOC, uh, massive open online. And uh, can HPI, UN, and us come up with the beginning of a clearinghouse for some of these design solutions at this really pivotal time for the world? Why are they having to reinvent things? Why can't they take ideas that have been adapted? Um, I so I want to end on this note. What Brock said about dignity in death brings us back to our humanity. Um, and we all want dignity as human beings. And so this, this brings us together, regardless of religion and this or that or the other. Uh, we can look after ourselves together to have dignity in life and in death. So I hope that we can stay together. That's my wish. Thank you, Maylin. And, and dignity and all, at all age levels, young, older, middle age. And, and I think that that's a very... Um, if does do you Brock or Gopal have any other things to any comments to add? Okay, if not, um, I'd like to thank all of you for your wonderful presentations, your your excellent ideas, and we will now let the audience start the break. Um, there'll be a networking break right now, so thank you everyone for for all of your your insights, and goodbye. Mm -hmm.